910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back. We are in the middle of our series, Be Transformed, and we've been talking about the greatness of God and the goodness of God, if you've listened to the last couple episodes. And we said in those episodes that it's our purpose to glorify him. And one of the ways that we glorify God is when we turn from our sin and repent. That's true of our initial salvation, but it's also true for the rest of our lives. As Martin Luther put it, we are simul eustus et peccator, which means simultaneously just and sinful. You know, we continue to repent and turn from sin until we die or until Jesus comes back and takes us home, whichever comes first. Mortifying our sin, meaning killing our sin, is not easy. But as we've seen, Chris, God is good. He's given us a helper, the Holy Spirit, and he's given us a promise to never leave us and never forsake us. And that's a promise that's echoed throughout the Old and the New Testament. And thankfully it is, <laughs> you know, it's so easy to get off track and keep telling ourselves that we're headed in the right direction, even though we're not, we all do it, but there are some warning signs that can help us see when there's danger ahead so that we can change course and keep making headway in our transformation. In light of that today, we're going to take a little bit different angle on transformation and we're going to give some of those warning signs and red flags that we might be about to derail our transformation. And it's possible that some of us might be derailed already, not making any headway at all toward our sanctification. And for those of us in that situation, just think of this as a call to action. And Rose, this is possibly going to be a tough episode. And we want everyone out there to know that we've both been there and we still struggle. Absolutely. There isn't a Christian who hasn't. You know, although we won't be totally without sin this side of heaven, every believer can begin crucifying their sinful nature. In fact, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Paul taught the church in Ephesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Chris, it's hard to fight our lingering sin nature, but it's non-negotiable. You're right, Rose. It is a non-negotiable thing. In Colossians 3, it says we're to put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lying, idolatry, you name it. Anything about us that's not like our Savior. If we've been raised with Christ, We've died to our old self, and we've got to cooperate with the Spirit to fight our sin to the point of killing it. In the words of John Owen, a well-known Puritan pastor, be killing sin or it will be killing you. We've used that before. Wise words. Wise words. In light of that, let's get rolling on what some of those red flags are. So I'll start. Our first red flag that we might be headed toward derailment is if we find ourselves looking for agreement from others that what we're doing or thinking about doing that we know deep down is wrong is okay. And let's be honest, our friends hate to tell us bad news. And often if you ask enough people, especially on the internet, you can find lots of people who are sympathetic to your situation. You know, there's tons of posts in social media groups wanting to know if it's okay For example, for a Christian to keep doing Eastern meditative style yoga, or if it's okay to live with their boyfriend or whatever, there's lots of different things. And many get a lot of answers that they want to hear. Sometimes because the people answering are steeped in their own sin, the ones that they're the very ones that they're asking about, but other times they get answers that they want to hear because the people that they're asking don't really know the Bible. They don't know what it teaches. And, you know, if we know deep down that what we're asking for is sin, we need to force ourselves to go to someone who knows the Bible and who's wise. And so we can get a straight answer, a truthful answer. Right. 
you know, not something that's likely to happen on social media, no. <laughs> not even in a, a Christian group, you know. No. According to a 2017 Lifeway research poll in America, only 11% have read the Bible the entire way through. Of those 11%, only 9% have read all of it more than once. And 2017 was the latest that we could find for that stat. Rose, we say it all the time. Scripture interprets scripture. If you've only read from the front to the back once, or even if you have a few times, you really don't know what the Bible has to say on most subjects. And that's not a judgment we're making. We're just telling you that's the reason you need to go to a trustworthy, godly person who does know and understand the Bible fairly well and get your advice. You know, someone that's walking with the Lord. Not that anyone's doing it perfectly for sure, but someone who'll keep a confidence, especially if something's deeply personal. So get good advice. And get the scripture where their answer's from to make sure it's good advice and study it. Good point. Get sound advice and then listen to that advice. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And there's another one that's very similar. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. That's Proverbs 19, verse 20. That's right. It's not going to, the advice isn't going to help if you don't listen to it. Right. Okay. So the next red flag that we might be derailing is if we find ourselves justifying our sin, saying things like everybody's doing it, but Rose was <laughs> wrong with everybody doing Sounds it. Sounds like my kids when they were yeah. younger. <laughs> yeah. We've all said that. We have. That's true. I'm sure I've said it. You know, Chris, we're kidding ourselves if we think there's safety in numbers. Even if what we're doing seems like a logical thing in the world, and a lot of people agree with it, if it's not biblical, we need to stop. In fact, if everyone is doing it, that's a huge red flag to stop even before we do anything and ask ourselves, is this biblical? Proverbs 21.30 says, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. Proverbs 3.5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Right. Because the truth of the matter is God never changes. He never changes his moral law based on what humans think or what they want. Not even when a whole bunch of them wish he would. There are several scriptures that tell us God never changes. But in this instance, Psalm 119.89 is probably one of the most relevant. It says, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. You know, and as much as we might not like it that God doesn't change based on what we want, there's a very comforting side to God not changing. Absolutely. In fact, it's, yeah, it's one of the most comforting aspects about God. I agree. God's immutability, the fact that he doesn't change, is great news for those of us that are trusting in him. It's bad news for those who don't, but for those of us who are saved, we know that he will not and cannot fail to keep the promises he gave to forgive us. In fact, to keep all of the promises he gives to us. Amen to that. So I feel like I'm giving all the flags here, but here's the next one we're going <laughs> to talk about. Uh, and that's derailing when we're hiding our sin from others. The reason we hide our sin is because of the shame that we think it's going to bring when others know about it. And Rose, it's hard enough feeling the weight of our guilt that the sin brings. And then who wants to feel shame on top of that? But that's the kind of thinking that often keeps us stuck in the same place, in that same sin and with the same guilt and the same shame. Absolutely. And fear of finding out, being found out. Absolutely. And if we're in that situation, we need help. That's one of the reasons God put us in a community with other believers. There's no lone ranger in Christianity. The importance of being in a local church, among other things, and we're going to talk about that in a few weeks, is having fellowship with other believers, having people you can trust, godly people. Galatians 6, 1 to 3 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burden 
and this way obey the law of Christ. Right. I mean, go to someone. Like we said earlier, go to someone who knows the Bible and is trustworthy and go in private. I, Rose, I don't know about you. I am not a fan of Christians airing their individual sins to groups of people with the possible exception of it being a very small group of people that are definitely mature Christians and that they know and trust wholeheartedly. When you've got a sin problem that you're ashamed of telling someone about, you're looking for biblical advice, someone to come alongside you in prayer and for accountability if the situation calls for that. Definitely. Even though it's really hard because we feel ashamed, you know, staying in our sin instead of seeking help just drags out the inevitable. And, you know, unconfessed sin has power over you. There really is something about confessing it to someone. And we're not saying a priest or anything like that. But when you get it out in the open to someone, someone you trust, like you said, Chris, it loses its power and then you can begin to deal with it. There's just some things we can't handle on our own. So stop hiding, ask God for forgiveness and get help if we're in this situation. In the long run, you'll be glad you did. Absolutely. You know, Chris, something else that keeps us from transformation is because we're not being honest with ourselves that we have a sin problem. And that's our next red flag. We're avoiding the fact that we've got a sin problem. You know, Rose, there are a couple red flags about this red flag that come to my mind. I've seen a couple things and there may be more. One is excessive exercise or extreme busyness. They can both be red flags when we're avoiding a sin issue. You know, sin brings anxiety. Exercise ups our endorphins and it makes us feel good. And being busy keeps us from thinking about our sin issues and keeps our minds elsewhere occupied. And if we're busy so we can push our sin issue to the back of our brains, guess what else we're too busy for most of the time? Being in God's word and being in prayer. Two things that bring conviction and repentance. I was just reading an article by Alistair Begg. And, you know, he said, if you're in a situation like this, your prayer can be three words. You don't have to go in lengthy prayer, but you need to cry out to God for help. If we want transformation to take place, we need to stop and we need to be honest with ourselves. We're certainly not fooling God. First John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, God is faithful. And like we talked about last week, he's also gentle and loving. Like we saw last week with Psalm 23. It's scary to acknowledge our sin because then we have to deal with the consequences. So I just want to give one more reminder about the God that we take our sin to when we repent and ask for forgiveness. And this is from Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11, and it echoes Psalm 23. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. You know, we need to remember that we serve a mighty God with those arms, but those arms hold us close and lead us gently. So don't be afraid. Just go to God. That's right. And I'm speaking from personal experience and people that I know. I've never heard anyone confess a sin and and really try to kill it that regretted doing that. I, I am totally there with you. I mean, there, that fear can keep us bound up for so long. Yes. And it's just so much better when we've dealt with it. Even if there's consequences, it's just so much better when we dealt with it. That's right. Before we were saved, we're a slave to sin. But if we're not trying to actively kill it, we're still being a slave to it. Yeah. And it is like slavery. It's drudgery. It is. It is. So, Chris, this kind of leads into the next red flag, is if we find ourselves saying, like Scarlett O'Hara, I'll think about it tomorrow. You know, there's a lot of verses that talk about procrastination. Now, I admit, 
there are things I do procrastinate about. I'm hoping that it's not this. I'm hoping the Holy Spirit convicts me if I am procrastinating about it. But Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Yeah, we're to be diligent because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. You know, I do this one with eating more than I need to. You know, it's fine to feast. Sometimes God talks about feasting in heaven and that's all fine. But every day shouldn't be a feast. And sometimes I find myself there day after day and gluttony is a sin. Uh, it's not one we like to mention very often in Christian circles because we like to feast a lot. Yeah. But it is a sin. And, you know, I went to a class a long time ago about eating. And this verse always stuck with me ever since then. This is one we had to memorize. And it's, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And it's true. Absolutely. It's true. But when you stick with something that's a better eating or whatever it is, exercise, anything, it's not easy. It's hard. But it does produce results, you know, unless there's something like wrong, transformation, saying, you know, whatever, <laughs> but it's transformation. And spiritually, when we set those disciplines for ourselves and we, we follow them, it really makes a difference. And there's a reward when we're diligent, whether it's our eating habits or exercise or a disciplined routine in the morning or evening for Bible study, like you and I've kind of committed to this year, Rose, and it, it's already making a difference yes. in things I know and things I remember and things I'm thinking about. So that's just a great verse if you can memorize it for, you know, discipline. So our next red flag is if you're contemplating going headlong into sin because you think in the end, it's all going to be okay. And that sounds like something we wouldn't do. But let's be honest, we've all done it. I mean, I'll confess, I've been driving and the person in front of me is really getting on my nerves. And I know that I should not be saying anything or slamming on my horn, yet I do it anyway. Yeah. So this is, you know, something we all deal with. And the truth is there's no guarantee the situation's not going to work out. There's no guarantee someone's not going to get out of a car and I'm going to be a victim of road rage because of what I've done just as an example. But another example that I heard recently was from someone who wanted to marry a non-believer who sounded like a really great guy. You know, the girl had several Christian relatives who married non-believers and most of the spouses eventually ended up being a believer. But Chris, the truth is there's no guarantee that's going to happen. And more importantly, the ends don't justify the means ever. Going into marriage would still be a sin, even if the person did become a believer eventually. And I confess that this was the case for my husband and I. Doesn't make the sin any less for the fact that it worked out. That's exactly right. And there's probably another aspect of this sin that we need to mention. And that's if we're persisting in sin, that we just refuse to give up. You know, there are lots of sins we go around the mountain and we, we're still trying to crucify. But I mean, if we have a sin that we're just headlong in and we're going full bore into it and we're not even wanting to change, you know, there's some pretty heavy warnings in the Bible about that. Second Peter 2, 19 to 22 says, whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. And that, sobering words. Those are very sobering words. And that's echoed several places like Hebrew 10, 26 and Matthew 12, 45 and other places too. You know, obviously, like I said, we're still going to be fighting sin and we may be fighting the same sin as we go through our whole lives. But if it's something that's persistent and we don't even 
we don't even want to try or we're not even trying to get out of, then we really should talk to someone about our faith. So we'll do another one. If we find ourselves saying someone else will take care of it when we know that we could and probably should have done it ourselves, we might have a sin problem because we're not doing something that we're supposed to be doing. And that's as much of a sin as doing something you're not supposed to be doing. This is called a sin of omission. It's our inactiveness that's sinful. Right. We can commit sins or omit doing sins, that's you know, right. and both is sin or omit doing something. And that is sin is what I meant to say. But James 4, 17 says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. We should ask ourselves sometimes, you know, if there's something that we could be doing that we're using an excuse not to neglecting study of God's word, going days without prayer not helping our spouse around the house, not serving at church? Are we playing video games when we should be looking for a job? I mean, there's endless things that we could mention. Yeah. Do we see a need right in front of us and we fail to do anything about it? We don't really need to say a lot about this. We just wanted to remind everyone that sins of omission are out there and they can hinder our transformation. We all have them in our lives, but we shouldn't think of them as nothing because God considers them sinful. Okay, yeah, Chris, point. let's do another one. And that's laying blame for our sin on someone else or something else. And this is where it can get a little ouchy. Yeah, you're right about that. Because it's very easy to come up with excuses for why we can't stop doing X, Y, or Z, or why we can't make ourselves do things that we know we should do, those sins of omission. Like you said, we blame someone else, we blame something else, we blame something that happened in our past, we blame something that someone did to us in our past, or we just blame our bad circumstances of life that we're in at the moment. And that's a tough pill to swallow. But the truth is those situations and circumstances don't take us off the hook for our sin. It's our sin. And I was thinking, you know, the man that they let down on the mat through the roof, you know, for Jesus to heal. Jesus didn't say, go and sin no more for no reason. That's Just right. because he was in a very, very bad circumstances, health-wise, he still had sin. Right. That's right. That's right. You know, and we want to be sensitive because we know there's a lot of people who've had tremendous abuse in their lives, painful turmoil, just catastrophic things happen, physical ailments. And we're not discounting any of that in any way. We're not discounting your pain, your suffering, your hurt, your scars. In no way are we discounting that. But we also want to bring biblical truth to the situation. And like you said, Chris, circumstances never take us off the hook for our sin. We're morally responsible for it, regardless of our life situation. We are. Matthew 15, 17 to 20 is where Jesus says, whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and, and is expelled. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, and anybody, almost everybody has done some of those things. Yeah, for sure. Chris, let's give an example. Let's say your husband, John, comes home from work and he's in a really bad mood. Maybe he's not very nice to you because he's grouchy and you get mad and you end up yelling at him. Whose fault is it that you yelled at him? It would be mine. You know, we have to own whatever sin is inside of us and whatever is inside of us, like the verse said, is what comes out. An example of this is, when you apply pressure to a wet sponge, if it's soaked with water, water's going to come out. If it's soaked with milk, milk is going to come out. If it's soaked with blood, blood's going to come out. And the pressure that you put on it had nothing to do with what came out of the sponge because whatever came out was already in it. So if I yelled back at John, that would be my sin, not his. And he may have sinned too, and it doesn't have anything to do with his sin. He his right. sin doesn't exonerate me. 
I'm still responsible for the sin I commit. And I think that's an important point to make. We're not saying in any way that if something's been done to you, that by you not sinning, you know, you're taking responsibility. That person's going to have to face God for what they did and take yep. responsibility for their own sin. The Bible says we can't exacerbate situations by us sinning too. Right. And it is an ouchy point. It is. It's, just, it's one it that is. has to be made. It is. So the next red flag has a lot more to it than we could possibly get to today, but it's a specific excuse for sin that's been cropping up more. And that's if we're saying things like, I need delivered from bad sexual thoughts I'm having, or I need delivered from an whatever, unspoken vice. I need, I need delivered from fear, anxiety, envy, jealousy. What you probably need delivered from is bad teaching. Exactly. This kind of language usually comes from someone who's involved in what's known as deliverance ministries. And they are groups that perform rituals or use other processes, sometimes like exorcism, to cleanse people. And what they're cleansing people of is demons and evil spirits that they claim are the reasons that people struggle with all kinds of things, physical spiritual, emotional problems, but basically what they're doing is blaming sin on demons and spirits. And, you know, that's all we're going to say about that type of ministry until we do our false teaching series later this year. But the point we're making today is the same as blaming anything or anyone else for your sin. The buck stops with you. You have to own your sin. It's, it's not, you can't just say, oh, a demon, waiting to be delivered from a demon or a spirit for it. That's right. The devil can't make you do it. Not if you're a Christian. Not if you're a Christian. That's right. That's a good point to add. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to say no. That's right. And understand that we do believe in Satan and the demons that follow him because the Bible tells us about him. We did a series on it. We did an episode on it. And we do believe that they're real enemies. We do believe they're trying to tempt Christians, that they can make bad things seem good, that they twist the truth, especially when it comes to biblical truth. They love twisting the word of God to make Christians get off track. But we have three enemies when it comes to sin. The world, our flesh, which is ourselves, and the devil. And as the world tempts us with its desires and our flesh wants what it offers, those two enemies rarely need help from the third enemy, Satan, to get us to act ungodly and to get us to sin. Absolutely. You know... We did this episode about red flags that we might be dealing with that derail our sanctification. We did it so that we could recognize them before they get too out of hand. And instead of giving into desires, we fight our sin. Second Corinthians seven verse one says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. And another one like it is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 5, which says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Another sobering verse. Mm -hmm. The first step to killing sin and being on the transformation journey is to bring the sin out of the closet and call it what it is. Call it sin. You know, I remember years ago, a pastor saying, you know, don't, when you're confessing sin to God, don't say I was judgmental. Name the specific sin. Instead of saying, I'm sleeping with my boyfriend, say, I've been sexually immoral. Instead of saying, you know, the house is a mess, but my mom will clean it when she gets home. Say, I've sinned against God by being lazy and not honoring my mother and helping. Instead of crying that you need deliverance from pornography, cancel your cable, put a blocker on your internet, throw your computer out if you have to, get accountability from someone from your church. James 4-7 is our memory verse for this week, and it's a good one says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Good verse. You know, every believer has the Holy Spirit living inside of them, like we've said over and over. 
Not only does the spirit start changing our desires by renewing our minds as we read and study the word of God, he also gives us the power to say no to sin. And I don't remember when the first time was I heard that. That's not something that's taught in a lot of churches. But the first time I heard it, it was like a light bulb going off. That's we right. We do have the power to say no to sin because of the Holy Spirit. That's right. We are no longer slaves to sin. We will still sin for sure because we can't be perfect on this side of heaven. But we have the power. And if this episode sounded harsh or it seems like we're being too casual about things people are going through, think about Jesus's time on earth. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. On the cross, Jesus suffered much worse than we're ever going to suffer. You know, we want to challenge you this week to read two portions of scripture, and they're a little long, but they're worth it. Isaiah 53, which is the suffering servant passage about Jesus. And then follow that up with 1 Peter 4. You know, when you read them in that order and read them more than once, you're going to see some transforming thoughts in your mind, we think. I think so too, because it just hits you in the face what Jesus did for us and then what our response should be. So. Yes. Galatians 5.13 says, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Transformation is hard, and we want to leave you with a bit of encouragement, and that comes from 1 Corinthians 10.13, which is, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Amen to that. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible that gives us a pass for not growing in our sanctification. Nowhere does the Bible say you don't have to grow. Because a Christian has the Holy Spirit living in them, we have the power to say no to any temptation, regardless of what we've been through, regardless of our current circumstances. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave any of us where he found us. He's transforming all of us, all of his people, to be like Jesus. Amen to that. Have a blessed day, everybody. 